Chapter 6 Meeting the Professor In the morning, they were welcomed by knocks at their respective doors. Breakfast is downstairs in half an hour, a squeaky voice announced with each knock. Lydia washed quickly and dressed before going to the window and looking up and down the street outside. Several people were about already, and the shops were opening. She desperately wished she had time to go and look at them. There came another knock at her door. "'Are you ready, littlest Lydia?' came her Uncle Ambrose's voice. She skipped to the door, turned to get her bag, thought better of it, then opened the door. Standing outside was, of course, her uncle. By his knee, and about as tall as it, she saw another elf. He was like the one they had seen in the ministry, but had curly brown hair in a clump on the top of his head, and was wearing a green uniform. This gentleman, a uh, gentle elf, Ambrose explained, has kindly offered to show us to the breakfast room. My pleasure, sir and miss, the elf chirruped, bowing to Lydia. The rest of your party have gone down. Ah, oh, my fault, I'm afraid, Ambrose apologised. It takes a while for me to get moving first thing in the morning. Not a problem in the slightest, sir, the elf assured him. This way, please, sir and miss. The elf, whose name was Towser, they learned, took them down to the breakfast room, which was the opposite side of the lounge from the room where they had dined the previous evening. Hannah waved to them from behind the bar, where she was arranging the glasses with the aid of her wand. "'Good morning. Be with you in a second. she smiled. "'The others are in there already.' The others were, indeed, all already there, but were still taking their seats. They greeted the latecomers cordially, and everyone shuffled around to make way for them to take their places at the table. Hannah and Neville served them their breakfasts while they discussed the day ahead. It was agreed that Ambrose should join the discussion with Draco, but that Lydia did not need to join them unless she wished. "'Oh, I don't know now,' she said. "'I want to be in with you all, but, well, I would like to see the shops in Hogsmeade.' "'Well, that's easily solved,' said Hermione. "'Draco isn't free until late morning. We will have time to look at the shops before you go up to Hogwarts.' Lydia clapped her hands. They spent a while after breakfast taking the muggles around the wizarding shops of Hogsmeade. They visited Gladrag's Wizardware, Dogweed and Deathcap Herbology Supplies, Dominic Maestra's Music Shop, Scrivenshaft's Quill Shop, and walked past the headquarters of the Wizarding Wireless Network. In Spin Twitch's sporting needs, Harry told them more about his days as the seeker and captain of the Gryffindor Quidditch team. He showed them all the equipment Quidditch players needed the quaffles, the bludgers, the beater's bats and the snitches. He tried once again to describe how the games were played and the tactical considerations. After spin twitches, they went into honeydukes. Lydia was enthusiastic about all the unusual sweets they discovered there. Somehow she found it necessary to examine every different type they had on sale. Neville had a quiet word with the Mrs Honeyduke, and she made up a sizeable bag containing one or two of almost every sweet available. She had thoughtfully left out any of the more niche flavours, such as blood-flavoured lollipops and cockroach clusters. After Lydia's thorough investigation of Honeydukes, they had no time left to visit any other shops before needing to make their way up to the school. It was a beautiful morning in that part of Scotland, so, as Hagrid was teaching, they had elected to walk up to Hogwarts. Neville pointed out magical plants to Lydia along the way. By the time they reached the gates of Hogwarts, she was spotting ones which had been pointed out to her earlier, and, in most cases, could remember their properties and uses. "'You make such a good student,' Neville told her. "'I wish all my classes paid as much attention.' Beyond the sturdy iron gates and the winged boar gate guardians, the slim figure of a man with white blonde hair was striding towards them. He beamed in welcome as he opened the gates to the party. Harry turned to the muggles. This is the man we came to see, Ambrose, Lydia. This is Draco. Draco shook hands warmly with everyone in the visiting party, though Ron put his hand out grudgingly and rapidly claimed it back. 
Hermione glowered at her husband but said nothing. Lydia liked the look of Professor Malfoy. He seemed genuinely happy to see them all, even Ron, and eager to please. Lydia always liked to please people, though some would not allow it. Those people you had to hope would come round eventually. As they walked up the drive to the castle, Harry and Draco took it in turns to explain how they had met up some years after the events of the Wizarding War. Both had, with some effort, put past differences behind them, and Draco had explained how he wanted to do something useful with what his experiences had taught him. As Draco's whole life had been steeped in the dark arts, mainly by his estranged father, Harry had suggested he teach Defence Against the Dark Arts at Hogwarts. The post had, thankfully, after Voldemort's demise, lost the jinx that had caused teachers to be unable to remain in the job for more than a year. Porteus Wilkins, a former aura and distant relative of Harry's, had taken the post for several years, but was considering retirement at that time. Harry had approached Professor McGonagall to recommend Draco. McGonagall had been surprised and quite reluctant, but because it was Harry who was putting Draco forward, she had agreed to get Professor Wilkins to give Draco some training. Draco and Wilkins had shared the post for a term. Wilkins had declared him one of the best teachers of the subject he had ever known. It was never clear how many other defence teachers Porteus had known, but McGonagall had given Draco the job permanently. McGonagall had spent another year at Hogwarts before retiring, and had confided to Harry, he now admitted, that Wilkins had been right about Draco's ability. Draco was delighted to hear this from Harry, but modestly put Wilkins' comment down to a desire to get on with his retirement. Ron remained notably silent through this whole discussion. Lydia did not overlook his sullen expression. The last lesson period of the morning had started, and again there was nobody about as they made their way from the entrance hall downstairs to the dungeons. Draco's office was the one that had once been Severus Snape's. The new potion masters had other suites of rooms further along the corridor. They noticed a silver plaque by the door which read, Severus Snape, Professor and Head Teacher of Hogwarts. A brave man. Harry paused by the plaque for a moment and nodded once. Draco opened the door and welcomed them all in. To Ron, who had not been back to this office since his student days, it was unexpectedly lighter, less cluttered, less intimidating, and noticeably larger than when it had been Snape's. Gone were the jars of pickled things and the general air of gloom. The centrepiece of the room was a desk, with a number of comfortable chairs laid out as if for a tutorial or discussion group. The walls were lined with bookshelves and display cases containing small objects which looked interesting but not too frightening. It was a long way from being the kind of collection the magical friends had known from places such as Borgen and Burke's in Nocturne Alley. It doesn't seem as dark artsy as I'd expected, Ron noted. I have another room for the truly dark stuff, Draco explained. I often invite groups of students in here for discussions, and I don't want them shivering in fear. A chuckle ran around the group, but skipped over Ron. Please, take a seat, everyone. Draco gestured to the chairs. And tell me how I can help you. Once seated, Draco offered them all drinks. Lydia, Ambrose and Hermione took a glass of water each. At this point, Neville left them to go to tend to his greenhouses. Once he had gone, Harry explained the diary and its origins, Ambrose filling in the details as they went along. Draco listened intently, nodding from time to time. Well, Draco began, once the recap had been completed, it sounds as though it all holds together. I don't know where this muggle has got his information from, but it seems to agree with what we know of the old magic. So what exactly is old magic? Hermione asked. I've seen it mentioned many times, but it never seems clear what makes it different. The old magic is not the normal type of magic, but older or performed a long time ago. But the two things do get confused. True old magic is different from our sort of magic. The magic we teach, strictly speaking, is known as high magic, distinct from old magic. To make it more confusing, some of our high magic has elements of old magic. 
What distinguishes between them is that old magic is slower to cast, but has deeper and longer-lasting effects. It is fundamentally rooted in nature and draws on the power of primal forces, like weather and tides and life, living things, both plants and animals. The protection your mother gave you against the Dark Lord, Harry, that was truly old magic in this sense. But that didn't take a long time to cast, Harry protested, sounding confused. It happened in moments as Voldemort attacked. No, Draco shook his head and leaned forward. The power behind that magic was forged over time. It probably started when your parents, both of them, wanted a child, or certainly by the time you were conceived. It grew as you grew inside your mother. It grew as you were born, as they took care of you, nurtured you, put their lives into you. You know this, Harry. You're a father. That love and sacrifice is continual. The attack you survived, and your parents did not, was just the trigger. Your mother's sacrifice for you was the end of a kind of ritual, bringing that power together into a deep and strong protective charm, causing the Dark Lord's curse to rebound on him. A silence fell across the group. For most of them, this stirred old memories. I call it a ritual because that is key to using the old magic, having the appropriate ritual to shape the forces of nature into the magical effect you want. From what I've understood in my studies, it seems that Dumbledore had quite a developed appreciation of the old magic. As far as I can tell, he took the remnants of your mother's protective magic and kept it alive in a protective charm around your childhood home, where you grow up with your aunt's family. I didn't understand at the time, but there were things I heard him, Voldemort, say which support that idea. I think the Dark Lord was aware of the old magic, but I don't believe he could use it as well as Dumbledore could. You know, Harry said hesitantly, Dumbledore told me more than once that certain actions have deeply significant meanings that can affect magic. Quite right, Draco agreed. Rituals are merely a formalised sets of actions. Dumbledore was so much cleverer than I ever knew, he added, a shadow of sorrow passing over his face. You said, Draco, Hermione interjected, that some of our high magic uses old magic? If you think about it, Draco looked up at her with a wan smile. Potence fits the description of old magic. You bring together natural ingredients in a specific way, a ritual. You add an ingredient which you've cut up in a certain way, stir it a ritual number of times, heating it for a ritual number of minutes until it changes colour. It's all ritual. There were ahs and ums of understanding from his audience. This idea of turning muggles into wizards... Harry asked. Is that at all possible? The old magic rituals were made thousands of years ago, before we had civilizations, just nomadic tribes. The rituals were passed down the generations by the shaman of the tribes. Shaman? Harry asked. A shaman was like the Native American medicine man or tribal African witch doctors, Hermione explained. That's right, Draco confirmed. Well, wizards, as we know them were first recorded in ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia. There is a theory that they were the first wizards that ever existed. The shaman were not wizards with powers like ours. Wizards were created. How? asked Harry, bemused. The theory is that a shaman, or group of shaman, using old magic rituals, created a way of turning non-magical people into wizards and witches. They might have done this directly or by making some magical object which then had the power to make muggles into wizards. Some sources suggest that other magical creatures, possibly the ancestors of our house elves, showed the shaman how to do this. Others speculate that it happened by accident. We don't know. Then where did wands come into this? Harry asked. Wizards need wands to have control over their magic. That isn't clear either, Draco admitted. But wand-making is said to involve a lot of ritual. It's another piece of high magic that is like old magic. So, if this nutter had the right ritual, Ron began. Well, that's a big if, Draco pointed out. If this is what happened, that was thousands of years ago. And magical historians have never found any real evidence. The diary, Ambrose began, 
surprising everyone else. It mentions that Granville also had a grimoire, which is some kind of book of magic spells. Maybe there is a record of rituals which has been kept a secret. It's not impossible, Vico conceded, but it would be in an ancient writing and language. These things do get found and translated, Ambrose pointed out. The Epic of Gilgamesh is a Muggle poem that is about 4,000 years old, written in Akkadian, yet we have translations now. Wizards might well have had better ways of preserving such important information. You said that there might have been a magic object that turned people into wizards. Maybe he's got the object, and this spell book tells him how to use it. It was Lydia's turn to surprise them all. Is that possible, Draco? Harry asked. It's very unlikely, he scowled. It's more likely that this is some kind of prank. If we can't rule it out, Harry insisted then my office has to take this seriously. Draco thought for a moment. It is possible, he sighed. But what's the worst that could happen? We get a few more witches and wizards. What's wrong with that? Ron interjected. Remember the problem we had with wizards who hated muggle bones? This could be much worse, Harry explained. He looked at Draco. The pure-blood traditionalists wouldn't like it, I imagine. This could completely stir them up again, said Draco, shaking his head. It gets worse, though. Worse? asked Hermione, horrified. According to the same theory, and this was the bit there seemed to be some evidence for, the first wizards were immensely powerful. It was like they had the same control over old magic and high magic as we have over just high magic. And this might have been before wands. The whole group took several moments to contemplate this. There's something else, Hermione added. There's a theory that wizards and witches born with magic tend to be, at least on average, more responsible with their powers. Naturally more responsible than, say, a muggle suddenly given lots of power. Not everyone is the same, of course. Look at Voldemort. But even wizards who haven't been to a school like Hogwarts are quite restrained in how they use their power. Muggles with power are notoriously bad. I say that as a muggle bomb, she added. A bunch of mad muggles who are super magical, casting everlasting spells without wands. What could possibly go wrong? Ron groaned. It certainly sounds like something to be taken seriously, Ambrose agreed. I need to spend more time on this diary, Hermione decided, and I think I need Draco's help. In that case, Harry said, we need to talk to Professor Lee again. That'll be fun, Bron said with more than a little irony. Am I missing something? Draco asked. Ron was about to speak, but a glance from Hermione seemed to change his mind. She seemed resistant when we spoke to her last night, Harry explained. Oh, I wouldn't worry, Draco reassured them. Nobody's Hogwarts likes the idea of the Ministry getting involved in the school. Not after Umbridge and the Carrows and all that. It's nothing personal, Harry. Actually, I always got the impression she quite likes you, he added with a meaningful smile. I am sure that we can accommodate you, Harry, Professor Lee smiled gesturing with her arms spread wide and stepping around from behind her desk. It's the least that I can do, after the way I treated you yesterday evening. Please, you've got to forgive me for that. Professor Lee had apologised several times already for her previous apparent hostility. They murmured, not a problem, and think nothing of it once more. The head teacher had given Hermione and Draco free reign with the restricted section of the school library, and also her personal library in her office. She claimed to have books in there that even she knew nothing about. In addition, she had offered them rooms within the school to ease the burden on the three broomsticks. Realising that it would cut down on travelling time and make their working hours more flexible, they had graciously and gratefully accepted. Harry felt that the last remaining question might prove to be a stumbling block. He broached the subject with some trepidation. Professor Lee, uh, De Kelly, he ventured. 
Our friend Ambrose here has already given us useful information and may have some background which would prove useful to our investigation. Hey, that's fine if your non-magical friends need to stay too, the head teacher reassured him with a broad smile. I'll tell you what, I'll get one of our prefects to take your young lady around the school, see how we work, sit in on some classes. You have assured me that uh, procedures will be followed, after all. So I see no harm. Lydia looked astonished and delighted in equal measure. Ambrose smiled at her, eyebrows raised and head inclined. She beamed back, glowing with excitement. Professor Malfoy, the head teacher resumed, would you please ask Madame Hooch to bring Tessa Gudgeon to see us here in my office? Draco nodded, winked at Lydia, and left the room. Tessa is in Gryffindor and one of their sixth-year prefects, Professor Lee explained. She will look after Lydia, and Lydia can bunk with the first-year girls in Gryffindor Tower. Madame Hooch is the head of Gryffindor. She teaches flying and referees all the Quidditch matches, Harry explained to Lydia. I was meaning to ask you, Harry, Professor Lee said, leaning in close towards him. Do you think that Professor Longbottom would make a good head of house for Gryffindor? Yes, absolutely, Harry beamed. From what I've seen, the students respect him. He was in Dumbledore's army, after all. And he's no pusher of her either. We were aurors together. He won't take any nonsense from the students when it comes down to it. A good choice, I'd say, Dick Ellie. Good, good, she crooned. Madam Hooch is not as young as she used to be. The kids would relate better to someone younger. Please don't mention it to him yet. I'd like to sound out Rolanda first. Now, would anyone like a coffee while we're waiting? Ambrose took up the offer of coffee. Lydia had a pumpkin juice. Harry, Ron and Hermione asked for tea. How do you take your coffee, Ambrose? Professor Lee asked, her wand poised, ready to conjure a cup. Ambrose blinked and looked at her for a few moments. Orally, for the avoidance of doubt, and... Black, no sugar, please. The American regarded him for a few seconds before saying, Sure, and producing coffee as requested.